a brief overview of the collective investment scheme sector or market, and then also then go into the roles of the Securities and Exchange Commission as the regulator in uh, this space and look at uh, aspects of the regulatory framework for collective investment schemes, and then end by looking at uh, some of the responsibilities that investors have with respect to collective investment schemes. So for a start, just a second. For, for a start, this is a snapshot of what the market is looking like in terms of the collective investment schemes uh, that are locally based. So we currently have 11 fund management companies uh, and those are listed on the, on the screen on my left or on your left as well. And just to mention the caveat on the two that have asterisks on them. So these are under supervisory possession um, or some form of regulatory action. Uh, however, the funds still do exist. And um, on the right, we give a pictorial depiction of where the market is sitting in terms of assets under management. So you see there that uh, about 52% of uh, the assets under management are sitting with the Mpile Unit Trust, which is managed by African Life Financial Services. And then um, close to 24% are sitting with um, ABC Unit Trust, which is uh, under ABC Investment Services, now part of the Access Bank Group. And then the rest is split between a number of different uh, funds, as you can see there. Now, a glance of the sector in terms of the assets under management. So as of August 2023, we were sitting at approximately 1.7 trillion quarter in assets under management on the local funds front. And then for the foreign funds, we were sitting at 272 billion kwacha. Uh, so just to mention here that the local funds are the 11 fund management companies that I made reference to and the investments that they've made. However, there's um, also some funds that are domiciled outside of the country, but are marketed to Zambian uh, citizens and, and, and people that are doing this out here in Zambia. And those are the ones that are being referred to as foreign funds. So currently we have Standard Chartered Bank offering um, investments in, in foreign funds. Uh, so there's a number of them that they have. So this is the 272 billion kwacha in assets under management from the foreign funds perspective. As I mentioned um, earlier, uh, so we have 10 fund management companies managing 11 umbrella funds and a total of 58 sub funds. So, and then I think um, Joseph will explain a bit more about this, but your umbrella fund is the, the mother fund. And then you have the sub funds that come under it that have different investment objectives. So you could have, for example, an equity fund, which is skewed towards equities investments or a fixed income fund, which is skewed towards fixed income investments or a balanced fund that has a combination of both. So all those different sub funds appeal to different investment objectives or different um, preferences in terms of uh, investors. So depending on what you're looking for, you could invest in the different sub funds. And on the right, there is just a pictorial depiction of the split between the assets under management for your local collect investment schemes and the foreign ones, which is 87% to 13%. Now, in terms of the role of the regulator uh, in this perspective, the overarching role is obviously investor protection and market development as, pre as prescribed in the Securities Act. So this then also spills into essentially everything that we do, including our oversight and supervision of the collective investment scheme sector. And so on the right there, we just go into a bit more detail in terms of what this looks like. Um, you, you, you obviously have your gatekeeping functions, which includes your licensing of the different players within the sector. 
So for example, your fund management companies will need licensing, the authorizations as well that have to be given to these funds before they can uh, operate and be offered to the public, uh, registrations and, and, and so on. Uh, but we also are responsible for monitoring of compliance with the law. Uh, so this is for all the players within the space, uh, ensuring that everybody is complying with their requirements as prescribed by, by the law, uh, which we'll touch on more in the next few slides. And how we do this is through a number of, 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 of mechanisms. One of them is through um, monitoring of uh, return filings that are made to the commission. So for instance, uh, fund management companies have to submit regulatory returns, what we call regulatory returns into the commission. So these returns uh, provide information about different elements of the fund's activities. So what type of assets are being invested in? Uh, are these assets being held in custody? And, 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 and that sort of information over which period, when are, the, when are they maturing? Uh, how much cash are they sitting with at that particular time? So they send in this information that we then review on a periodic basis to ensure that everyone is complying with the requirements of the Securities Act. We also then undertake um, compliance monitoring. So desk reviews where we're looking at different financial information being submitted, different activities that we're seeing um, out in the public. And um, all of this feeds into, into the regulatory process. And then also on the market development front, uh, awareness raising is another critical uh, role or function that we, we undertake through events like this one, where we are engaging with the public, um, letting you know more about how uh, some of our products work, including collective investment schemes, is something that we do often. And uh, we also then support market development activities. So this could be facilitating for um, growth of, of, of different aspects of the market through, for example, supporting innovation, uh, through, for example, um, ensuring that we have a, a, an adequate or appropriate regulatory framework uh, and, and so on. So ultimately, um, we, we work to protect investors' interests, but also facilitate for the market to grow uh, with regards to how we regulate all different sectors, but also the collective investment uh, scheme sector in this particular case. Now, what does the regulatory framework of collective investment schemes look like? In essence, the, the overarching regulation is the Securities Act number 41 of 2020, uh, 2016, as amended by Act Number 21 of 2022. So this spells out what collective investment schemes are supposed to do, how you go about with the registration process. Um, so if you look at Part 10 of the Act, uh, so sections 120 around 121 to about 128, it spells out all the requirements relating to collective investment schemes. Uh, obviously, it also explains the fact that a business or an individual or an entity can't set up a collective investment scheme if yeah can't set up a, a collective investment scheme uh, without being regulated or without being authorized, and that's important uh, because then that essentially is the beginning. Of, um, of, of, of the regulatory journey from, from a, a collective investment scheme perspective. But there's also other um, subsidiary legislation uh, that we have in place. So your uh, collective investment scheme rules, which are sitting in SI number 161 of 1993, provide the greater detail uh, from the act in terms of uh, what's required of collective investment schemes. Um, it, it goes into the details of what exactly they should do as they undertake this business and the obligations that they need to, to, to comply with as, as, they, as they operate. Uh, then we also have additional legislation that is speaking to other elements of operating within the security space, which are also applicable in the collective investment scheme. Uh, uh, space. So you're looking at your conduct of business rules, for example, where all the licensees would need to comply with. 
and also your accounting and financial requirement rules. So we have other rules as well, uh, speaking to advertising, uh, for instance, and, and, and other elements of securities business that also apply to the collective investment scheme uh, space, particularly for entities that are licensed by ourselves. So this provides the regulatory framework uh, that essentially we, we, we utilize to uh, supervise the collective investment scheme uh, space. Now, continuing on in terms of the framework, uh, this is a pictorial depiction of uh, the structure that the law puts in place in relation to collective investment schemes and, and how um, they are supervised. So in essence, we have three, three entities that form part of this chain. Uh, on, on the one end, you have the fund management company. On the other, you have a trustee. Um, and then you also have a custodian, uh, usually a custodian bank that um, also plays a part in this uh, trustee because uh, by law, most of the collective investment schemes are set up as a trust. And, and so the, the trustee then uh, kicks in from, from that perspective. Now, in terms of the different roles that these players uh, play in this uh, scheme, essentially your trustee is responsible or represents the interests of the various investors in the fund. And they also ensure that there's adherence to the trustee. So once a collective investment scheme is being set up, one of the constitutive documents is what's referred to as a trust deed. And there's a number of, of, of things that are stipulated in, 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 in that deed in terms of how uh, the fund is going to be operated. And so the trustee's role is to ensure that it represents the interests of the investors, but also um, ensures that the trust deed is being complied with. Then the fund manager is primarily responsible for the day-to-day -day activities of the fund. So this includes managing investor records, actually making investments uh, of the monies that are collected, honoring client redemptions, attending to any queries or, or, or complaints. And um, all of those day-to-day -day activities essentially are undertaken by the, the fund management company. So obviously, um, in terms of, for example, operation of the bank accounts and, and, and uh, making those investments, this is done with the, uh, the delegation of the trustee through essentially a power of attorney to the fund management company to be able to, to, to make those decisions on behalf of the trustee in the interest of the fund manager. So there's a fiduciary duty uh, placed on the fund manager uh, to ensure that they act in the interest of the fund and also within the prescriptions of the law uh, and the constitutive documents, which is the trust deed and also the prospectus. And then uh, lastly is the custodian bank. So they're responsible for safekeeping of investor funds and uh, assets. Uh, so currently we have two custodian banks, which are Stanbeek and uh, Standard Chartered Bank. And uh, essentially all the investments that are made of these funds are then kept in, in safe custody with these custodian banks. Uh, with the trustee, we currently have one trustee in, 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 in our jurisdiction, which is uh, AMG Global Trustees Company. Uh, so they're essentially the ones playing that uh, trustee, trustee role. And like I mentioned, for the fund management companies, we have a total of 10 at the moment, managing 11 uh, collective investment schemes. Now, in terms of the investor responsibilities, uh, I thought this would also be important uh, because the investor has a role to play in ensuring that they are on top of things in terms of information uh, relating to the investment. So I have highlighted a number of things that you can do as an investor before and also after or during the time when you've made an investment in a collective investment scheme. So the first one is to undertake due diligence. Uh, so by due diligence, sometimes due, due diligence is, is mistaken to be a, a, a complicated process, but it doesn't necessarily have to be. It just means that you've, you've, you've done some background checking. And we do this all the time with, in, in other uh, aspects of our lives. 
uh, if, for example, you're moving into a new neighborhood or trying to move into a new neighborhood, you will probably ask the neighbors to say, oh, what's this place like? Is there any crime? Is there any, any issues I should be worried about before you make that decision? So it's a similar process uh, with, with the collective investment schemes. So before you invest, it, it, it's good for you to, to ask some questions. So for example, you could talk to some prospective um, fund management companies let them show you, for example, the history of their performance, how they performed in the past, what do their products look like, what are some of their fees, um, do, do they have any constitutive documents like a prospectus that you can go through and then you ultimately see if you're comfortable with or not. Uh, and, and the big question also here uh, from an investor protection perspective, uh, it might seem a bit trivial, but it will also be important to ensure that this entity is licensed. We've seen in the past um, um, here at the commission, some instances where individuals or entities have gone about trying to sell investments uh, or purported investments in collective investment schemes that are not authorized and licensed by the commission. Yeah, so you, you want to ensure that this company is also duly licensed. We, we, we don't want to take anything for granted. So once you do this due diligence, you have all of this information and then you determine at that point whether you are satisfied with what you're hearing, and uh, you can then go on to the next step of investing in this fund, right? So if you do then make that decision, you, you can, there's a process, my colleague Joseph will, will, will talk more about what's required to, to invest. Um, once you then invest, obviously, the other thing uh, you would need to do is to monitor your investments. So this is another common thing I've, I've, I've tended to notice in interacting with um, different um, people from, from the public uh, who've made investments. Sometimes we, 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 we tend to be relaxed. We, we, we put money uh, into these funds and we disappear for two years without really paying attention to how the fund is, 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 is performing, how our investment is moving. So it's important that you also take a more active role in monitoring your investment. Uh, do, you, do you request for client statements? Uh, for instance, these can be given to you um, upon request, the same way you do it at the bank. And, and this statement will tell you what your contributions are looking like, how much in terms of the, the market value are you sitting on in terms of your investment, how has it grown or changed over the, 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 the period that you're looking at, and so on. It's, it's, it's a good practice for you to do that so that in that way you can ensure that you are actively participating, but also you'll be able to pick out any uh, anomalies if uh, in the unlikely event there's, there's an anomaly, if there's such a thing, you can quickly pick it out. Um, so the, the other thing is around uh, reporting any sus suspicious activity. And this is really not just unique to the collective investment scheme uh, space, but generally as an investor, if you notice anything uh, strange, and again, it links into the monitoring. If you notice anything strange, say your investment is, it has changed in a strange way. Similar to also banking, if you just see a transaction on your bank account, you've been credited with 100,000 kwacha, which you're not expecting, you don't know where it's come from. Your first instinct is to go to your bank and say, well, there's this thing that I'm seeing on my statement uh, that looks strange. I'm not sure what's going on. Could you help me rectify? It's the same concept in, in this particular instance. You notice anything that may seem suspicious, and this could be even just a complaint maybe this, you requested a statement, you're not getting it, you can then engage the fund management company uh, to explain your grievance, and then they'll then be able to assist. Uh, and if after you engage them, they are not able to assist you, or they're not able to rectify your challenge, or it's just something suspicious that's involving the company itself, you could always then feel free to come through uh, to ourselves, the regulator, and we will then be able to see how we can assist. If it's a complaint, we, we have a complaints team that handles complaints. They'll be able to assist you, uh, look into what the challenge is. Uh, sometimes it's just a matter of a misunderstanding or miscommunication. Uh, so we could help rectify that. Sometimes that could even be addressed at the, the, the level of the fund management company. But what's important is that you've taken that step to, to bring that issue out uh, so that then it can be addressed. And then the last one is for you to stay informed. So by this, I simply mean, just keep track of what's happening. I know that um, fund management companies and companies that operate collective investment schemes are mandated by law to hold 
annual general meetings with their members where they explain the fund's performance, where um, they, 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 they engage with their members and address any questions that they might have. And so it would be important for you to attend such meetings, uh, for instance. Um, and also then it ties into the monitoring of your investments. Are you following, um, are you keeping track with your, 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 your customer statements? Do you look at your um, the, the, the fund's um, financial performance? Uh, you can request for this information from your from your fund management company um, for the the audited financial statements. For example, this is information that can, can be availed to you as a member. You 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 stay informed and ensure that you're you you're keeping track of your of your investments. Ultimately, all of this is going to help you one be more actively um, engaged in your in your investment journey, and I think for me that makes it more exciting because you're you're also playing a role. But then it will also help you be able to ensure that you um, are monitoring your investment and are keeping track that it is safe, and you can then help us as the regulators also um, help you as, as an investor. So ultimately, that's where I would like to end. And I thought a good way to, to end it would be with this quote that I came across from a Japanese author by the name of Yuno Suke Satoro. And uh, he said, alone, we are but a drop. Together, we are an ocean. And I think this beautifully encapsulates the, the power of the collective investment schemes. They allow uh, members of the public to put their resources together so that they are better placed to achieve collective prosperity by leveraging off of the large numbers that come with investing um, uh, collectively. And so they are a wonderful product that will enable you to be able to um, inch closer towards meeting your investment goals. They are quite flexible, as I mentioned, in terms of the, the sub funds that are available to speak to your unique investment objectives and they will be able to definitely help you. And so my colleague, Joseph, at this point, will come in and uh, speak to an industry perspective, and then we'll be able to take uh, some questions from you and, and interact a bit more after that. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Benson, for that uh, elaborate presentation. Well delivered. We'll now go to Joseph to give us the industry perspective. Then we'll take the questions at the end. Joseph, you've got um, 20 minutes to make your presentation. Thank you very much, uh, Stanley. And uh, I'll surely make it quick. Uh, please confirm that I'm audible. Yes, you are audible. We can get you. Thank you. All right, so we will quickly look at uh, uh, the Capital Markets Association of Zambia, just a brief uh, profile. Then we'll talk about the relevance of investing and what a unit trust is or a coll collective investment scheme, how it works. Um, we will not talk about who takes care of the investments, it's been tackled by uh, Benson and very well uh, done. Then um, we also just look at the investment options and the benefits of investing. So uh, the Capital Markets Association of Zambia, uh, its uh, uh, core objective is basically to promote uh, capital markets uh, participation and also to uh, lobby and uh, disseminate information to to the members and also capital market uh, players. Uh, we also uh, have uh, a wide or, or broad uh, membership base. So this means uh, our members are not only supposed to come from or do not just come from the, the financial sector, but also we have members that are in different uh, fields, but because they are in, uh, interested in the capital markets, and these include the corporates as well as individuals. So then uh, a unit trust basically, or why should you invest 
in a unit trust, or we can say uh, what is a unit trust, maybe just to quickly uh, speak about this, although my colleague, I think he, he spoke about it, so we might not really go deep, but uh, it's basically a pool of funds where uh, investors come together and then they trust, they put the money uh, together and uh, entrust it with the, the fund manager to invest on their behalf. So why should you invest in a unit trust? So basically, this will help you to secure a future. So this, these unit trusts are, are basically a, a very good avenue, which will help you to uh, have a safety net. I know uh, most of us, uh, maybe some of us who are doing this uh, meeting are uh, in employment currently, but uh, we never know what the future holds. We never know when we might uh, leave employment or when we might lose our job. So if we haven't set something aside, uh, it becomes a very difficult uh, situation to deal with. So it will help you to secure the future. And then there are better returns that come as a result of uh, you know, making investments through uh, collective investment schemes. Then you also benefit from a diversified portfolio through that pooling of funds. So because um, the fund manager or uh, uh, the, the, the institution that you are investing with is going to basically have a lot of money to invest and then they can place it in various assets depending on uh, which investment option you have chosen. So how does it work? Uh, so basically this unit trust um, is formed or designed uh, in a similar fashion as the, the way shares work. When you invest in a unit trust, you will invest in a pool of funds. So there are many other investors that are seated uh, in that portfolio. So for, for a member to invest in the fund, they are basically joining the pool and buying units in the fund. So these units are the same as the way we buy shares in listed companies. Then um, the other thing is, uh, so for the value of the shares, uh, basically you're going to have, uh, um, these, these, these shares in the fund are uh, divided into uh, more like uh, shares, and then these are called uh, or they'll provide a net asset value, which will provide the value of the units. So what basically, or maybe in simpler terms, I would say the, the, the units will have a price. And that price will give us, uh, if, so for example, if you buy the units now uh, at, a, at two quarter, for example, uh, the number of units that you have multiplied by the price is what will give us the value of the investment. So that's basically what this is uh, saying in simple terms. Then, um, so to open uh, an account, uh, first of all, you need to have a fund manager, right? Uh, you go and visit the fund manager and who is the fund manager? So the fund manager is basically uh, an institution who is going to manage your funds. So they have these um, uh, unit trusts, uh, like Benson, uh, Benson uh, mentioned, there are a number of uh, these fund managers uh, in the country. So they are, their job is to make sound investments because they know the market and they are going to uh, analyze uh, which will be the best investment for you. And they're going to uh, make sure that uh, once you make an investment, you have to, you, you're going to have a benefit and see a better return as opposed to uh, someone who doesn't have much information in the uh, financial markets. Uh, for them to just go to the market and say, I'm going to buy a bond, I'm going to buy shares. Uh, they might make a bit of some mistakes, but uh, you'll benefit from the professionals who are fund managers who will be able to make these very good investments for you. So there are a number of options. Uh, through unit trusts, you can choose to invest in uh, properties 
or equities or bonds. So these property investments are basically retail properties or uh, commercial properties. So there will be a fund, for example, which will have uh, assets under properties or assets uh, which are in property. So you have a choice. When you come to, a, a, to, to invest in a collective investment scheme, you can choose to say, I want a fund that only invests in properties or that has a portion invested in properties. So then you can participate. The good part is that you don't need to really own the actual property, but you can own the property through the uh, unit trust. Then you can also have shares. So the diversification also comes in very well when it comes to the shares aspect, because uh, as opposed to an individual or an institution buying shares uh, in one company through a collective investment where there are a pool, uh, where there's a pool of funds, there's a, a lot of money that is within the fund. So it, the, the, the institution or the fund manager will be able to buy shares in a number of companies, which will reduce the risk uh, on your investment and also give you a better return. Then there's also investment in bonds. So there's a diversified portfolio again in this aspect where you can buy uh, different uh, bonds with different tenures and you benefit from the returns that will come uh, from these investments. So this can also be through government bonds and also corporate bonds. Yeah, so I think we've tackled this also when we're talking about those kind of investments, but the returns, uh, maybe what just to mention, uh, there are no, uh, when you invest in a, a unit trust, as opposed to, let's say, uh, these other commercial bank kind of investments where you have a fixed uh, kind of investment, these are not fixed term uh investments. These are open-ended investments and you are allowed to grow your investment by making regular uh, contributions or deposits. Of course, there are fees that come uh, with these kind of investments. Uh, forgive me, there's a typo error there to, uh, when I was typing the scheme, yeah, but uh, anyway. So management fees are not standard. Uh, because we have various uh, fund managers who charge differently uh, depending on their services. So these management fees are basically uh, a fee that you pay the fund manager for doing the job on your behalf, the investments and all the, the issues uh, to do with the placements and making sure that your returns are good. Then the, uh, th these fees would range from 3% to 1.5% and the like. But if you have a choice to visit any fund manager and like Benson mentioned, you can actually, uh, this is one of the things that you, you can also look out for when you're doing your, your due diligence. Say, okay, so which one is the better fund manager in terms of fees and all those things. Then there are trustee fees, which are at 0.15%. Uh, and custodian fees, 0.17%, uh, and their audit and uh, CIS level fees, uh, which are also 0.125%. Uh, so all these fees are uh, net of whatever you're going to see uh, on your investment or returns that will be shown to you by your file manager. Yeah, this is basically the KYC that you need. So in case you wish to visit any of the uh, unit trust institutions or your institution fund managers that offer unit trust, uh, you need to have mm -hmm. all the request for uh, this KYC, the passport size photos, a proof of residence, uh, they will need the, uh, the proof of social funds and the copy of your ID. And uh, it's important to note that uh, through this unit trust, we can also actually have, uh, or rather invest on, uh, uh, on behalf of your children and uh, open an account in trust of your uh, kids to prepare for their future in terms of school fees and uh, many other uh, responsibilities that you, 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 you 
foresee in the future. So I think to end, I would like to just mention that uh, these unit prices are not uh, fixed, they fluctuate. Hence the disclaimer, uh, prices may rise or fall. So as you undertake these uh, investments, you need to take note uh, of that fact. Thank you very much. I hope I have been time. We can take questions now. Hey, uh, thank you so much, Joseph, for that elaborate presentation. Well said. I'm sure we've learned a lot and I'm pretty sure we're now all ready to uh, make some investments in collective investment schemes. We'll get straight into our Q&A session. Um, the first question that I have uh, from anonymous attendee, what is the sex stance on cooperative organizations and decentralized auto autonomous organizations involved in stock trading? So this is the question for the sec. Uh, ben, would you like to take this? What is the sex stance? Can you please repeat that? What is the sex stance on cooperative organizations and decentralized autonom autonomous organizations involved in stock trading? DAOs, what's our position? Okay, I can go ahead and answer. Yes. Oh, oh, okay. Um, okay, there's a follow up question. Yeah. Maybe you can combine the two. So it says can cooperatives and DAOs engage in crowdfunding or capital raising activities? So you can tackle the two. Uh, sorry, Stanley. Um, Did you get the second one? Yeah, so the, the second one is on cooperatives and DOs engaging in? Crowdfunding or capital raising activities. Okay. Okay, thank you. Um, so maybe to start with the, the cooperatives, uh, essentially there, there, there's some similarities between cooperatives and collective investment schemes, but... Um, there's also a number of differences. So a cooperative, by the way, it's structured is, is um, a membership-based institution. And there's actually a, a legal framework that in, in Zambia um, that, that stipulates how cooperatives are, are, are managed. So these could be agricultural cooperatives or savings and, and credits uh, cooperatives, or, for instance. Uh, but there's actually a, a, a registrar of cooperatives where such cooperative initiatives would be would be registered. Now, for cooperatives, you have to be a member. So you have to essentially buy into the cooperative. And then it has um, essentially bylaws that then dictate how, how, how they operate. The biggest difference is that with um, collect investment schemes, you would be able to market these to the public. It doesn't have to be to members. So you can go out and, and market them to the general public. With the cooperative, essentially you're asking people to, to, to join in and become members. So there's, there's a slight uh, difference there. And uh, in terms of the activities that a cooperative can, can undertake, uh, those are spelled out in the bylaws and they essentially shouldn't impede upon activities that uh, require licensing with the, with the commission, All right? So, if you're going to be engaged in essentially trading of securities, buying and selling of securities, that is an activity that requires licensing uh, in line with the Securities Act. So if, for example, that's what you're getting into, you're taking money from the public uh, for the purposes of investing it on their behalf, investing in securities, then that is, is taken as um, um, needing licensing or permission from, from the commission. Now, there's also an element that where you, you might be infringing upon the, um, for example, Banking and Financial Services Act in terms of deposit taking activities, uh, because then depending on the nature of these um, funds that you are seeking from the public, you, you, you might breach of the BFSA 
uh, because it also provides some stipulated procedures within which you need to um, uh, seek licensing for you to take funds from the public. So in short, cooperatives uh, exist in Zambia. You, you can undertake activities, including financial cooperatives, uh, but they have to be within the confines of the, the, the laws on cooperatives uh, with, the, with the registrar of cooperatives. Uh, anything that steps out of that, uh, you could easily find yourself straying into either breaching the Securities Act or the BFSA Act or any other. Uh, so that's also quite um, quite important. So this also applies then to, to DAOs and, and other, other mechanisms. Uh, now, in terms of crowdfunding, the concept is the same. If you are going to solicit for funding from the public in a manner that uh, requires you to, 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 to either register your, your securities with the commission uh, or, or otherwise, then you, you, you have a challenge. We, we are obviously have a regulatory sandbox. So we're entities that may be looking at innovations around pioneering crowdfunding solutions where we don't really have a regulatory uh, framework in place can, can approach us and uh, utilize those type of, 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 of platforms to try out these, these initiatives. Uh, however, if you went to the public to solicit for uh, investment, in, in a manner that would require you to, to, to follow procedure for uh, public securities, then that would be in breach of the, of the Securities Act. So sometimes the lines are quite thin. And if you're not sure, my advice would that be that you, you come through and see us and uh, we could have a chat around what you're trying to do and uh, provide more, more definitive uh, position. But that's my, my, my thought. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you so much, Benze, for that response. We have another question from Raymond Simba. Uh, the question is, how does the SEC define and regulate peer-to-peer -peer exchange of stocks? Can you explain the reporting requirements for transactions conducted on a peer-to-peer -peer basis? Are there specific disclosure obligations for participants in peer-to-peer -peer stock trading? Any other questions? Maybe we can take two. Take two. Okay. Um, the other one is uh, someone saying, I'm, I'm looking to start a fund management company. How do I go about it? Then we also have, is there a particular difference between a unit trust and a mutual fund? Maybe we tackle those. Okay. All right. Um, I'm thinking Joseph might be able to tackle the one on mutual funds, unit trust. That's fine. And then maybe I can do the other two. Is that okay? Okay. Joseph? Yes, that's fine. Uh, let me go first then. Eh? Oh, okay. Thank you. So in terms of peer-to-peer, uh, -peer, um, I, I hope I understood your question correctly. And my understanding was that you were asking how peer-to-peer -peer trading of shares works and my understanding of this is that essentially if you are an innovator or a company basically it's equity based uh, crowdfunding equity based crowdfunding where i come as an sme or as a company and i say give me some uh, funding and in exchange you get a stock of my uh, a stake of my company um, so that is, is is like i mentioned is what we call peer to peer um, crowdfunding and that for now would be something that you would be able to try out within our sandbox uh, because we currently don't have a regulatory framework speaking to uh, crowdfunding, including that, that sort. Uh, so for now, we've had two peer-to-peer -peer lending platforms in the, um, the securities exchange regulatory sandbox, uh, but that's more focused on um, loan-based peer-to-peer lending. So. I'm lending money to an individual and I pay back. So we do it directly without using uh, an intermediation platform, right? So that, that we have, and we've been trying out and, and, and we're still sort of in the stages of um, seeing whether we can develop a regulatory framework for that. But for, for equities-based crowdfunding, we currently don't have a framework, but if you had an innovation um, or, or, or a product that functions in a similar manner, 
uh, we'll be open to, to, to working with you to see how we can have that tested out in the regulatory sandbox. Uh, I hope that that answers that question. Uh, and then in terms of uh, how you could set up a fund management company, uh, so the first step would be for you to apply for a license. You need to have a dealer's license from the, from the SEC. Uh, and then on, if you visit our website, we have a list of the requirements for you to apply for that license. Uh, and then after that, essentially, you would then be able to set up a fund, which has another step of authorization that you have to go through. There's also requirements that you can find on our website uh, relating to that. So it's a two-step two process. First, you get the license. And then after you get the license, you then apply to have um, a, a fund authorized for the ones you set it up. And then after that, you'll be able to, to operate. So that's how you go about investing in uh, I mean, setting up a fund management company um, licensing, and then you have the fund authorized. So there's two separate processes for that, that you both have to uh, seek um, the permissions or, or the, the commission's uh, approval for. Um, Joseph, over to you. All right. Uh, thank you, Vincent. So uh, basically, the, I would say there is no difference because the principle is the same. But um, the main difference is that uh, with a mutual fund, or let me say a, a, a mutual fund is more like an incorporated type of a fund. But then the unit trust is registered under a trust deed. And uh, the beneficiaries of the unit trust are the unit holders. So what's the, what it simply means is that uh, when you invest in a unit trust, you are basically the owners of that, of that money that forms the fund itself. So if, for example, uh, a particular fund manager has this unit trust, where all the members decide to withdraw at the same time, it would mean that that unit trust will no longer exist. So that is practically the difference. The beneficiaries are the owners and the, it is more or less uh, uh, registered under a trust deed, but all in all, it is just the same thing. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Joseph. While I have you on the floor, um, there's a question from Wesley. What is your advice as to which trust I can invest in collectively, even if I have not done due diligence. That's what the question reads. I'm not sure if, um, Joseph, do you get that? What is your advice as to which trust I can invest in collectively, even if I have not done due diligence? Okay, so what they're saying is, uh, if I hear that question correctly, uh, they are asking if, there is any maybe unit trust which they can easily go to and invest without doing their due diligence. Uh, well, uh, there are quite a number of unit trusts because all the uh, mm -hmm. registered uh, unit trusts are regulated. So, in that sense, all of them. Uh, uh, are basically in order. At least they are following certain rules. So there's yeah. already an aspect of safety that they can uh, be guaranteed. So the best thing is obviously just for their own benefit to shop around before they make a decision. Yeah. But they can visit any of the the unit trust to make an investment. Yeah. Thank you, Joseph. Well said. So, uh, Mr. Wesley, I think you still need to do your due diligence. You need to shop around, like Joseph has said, because you cannot invest in something that you don't know about or you don't know what its benefits, its pros and cons are. So you still need to do your due diligence, do, do some shopping, then you can make your investment. Uh, we have another question from... I'd like to find out how we can take invest or take part in index funds such as S and P five hundred. Um, it seems Zambia is not among the countries that can invest in such. Why is that so? This is from BP Benaspiri. I can. Can I take that? Yes, Peter. Okay. 
Yeah, so um, in terms of, for example, investing in, in, in index funds, I know that locally we don't have any index funds at the moment, uh, but yes, uh, as has rightly been indicated, there's, there's a quite numerous number um, out there in, in, in other jurisdictions. So sorry for that. Yeah, so there's a number of um, index funds and other sorts of products uh, out there. Uh, in terms of how you can have access to these, primarily right now is is you would have to go through some of the entities that offer these. Uh, so if you, for example, visited, like I said, the the the, the entities that provide you an access with these international funds and products. Uh, I mentioned uh, Standard Chartered Bank who, who offer that service. Uh, you, you could then be able to have access to some of these, these products. Uh, so, but locally, we don't have any um, index funds at the moment. That's, again, that's an opportunity uh, for, for the entrepreneurs out there. It might be uh, something that could be developed uh, locally, uh, but then there are some providers uh, or, or, or intermediaries within Zambia that can give you access to these, these types of, of, of funds that you can speak with. Uh, so I mentioned uh, Standard Chartered as one of them. I, I think essentially on the, on the mutual fund perspective, they're the only ones that uh, are registered as agents for uh, foreign funds. Uh, so those are the only ones I can, I can point to uh, at this particular time. Okay, uh, thank you, Ben. Um, so what uh, Raymond Simba, the one who had asked the question about the peer-to-peer -peer stock transactions, I think, uh, says that uh, he meant private stock transactions, but he still has learned something from your initial response. Then we also have another question from um, Den, uh, an, from an anonymous ten attendee. Are there specific rules governing the issuance and redemption of digital ownership and credit instruments? ICOs and tokens. Benson, would you take that? Thank you, Sitali. Uh, so at, at the moment, we, we don't have a regulatory framework speaking to digital assets. For example, ICOs that we made reference to. Uh, as has been mentioned, the, the stance so far has been that we are willing to uh, test products that are related to, for example, crypto assets, digital assets, virtual assets, uh, and, and other innovations that do not currently have regulatory uh, frameworks. Uh, and that's why we developed the regulatory sandbox. And essentially, that's primarily where we'd be testing these. And then based off of the lessons and the experiences that we acquire from these test periods, we then see whether we can develop uh, alongside with the innovators, develop um, regulatory frameworks. But at the moment, uh, Zambia doesn't have, uh, so not just in the capital markets, uh, even across the uh, money markets and, and insurance space, uh, Zambia currently doesn't have any regulations uh, speaking to uh, digital assets or, or virtual assets. Okay, uh, thank you for that, Denzel. Uh, Joseph. Would you take this one? Um, we have a question here asking if there are any limits imposed on investors and how on how much they can invest at a particular time. Thank you, Pardons. I Joseph? think uh, yes, it's done. Are there are there any limits imposed on investors on how much they can invest at any particular time? If you'd like mm -hmm. to invest in a collective investment scheme, is there a limit as to how much? Um, thank you very much, Stanley, and thank you for that question. Well, there are no limits on how much uh, investors can invest at any particular time. But of course, uh, we just need to bear in mind that uh, there are issues to do with compliance, uh, FIC rules, and all other things. So uh, if someone is coming with the, the two million quarter at once, they have to be ready to be asked uh, source of funds, provided uh, their KYC 
uh, is not uh, uh, aligning with the transaction. So they are just those small things, but otherwise there are no limits. They can okay. start with any amount, yeah. Okay, well, thank you depends, for that. It depends also uh, with the other fund managers, uh, with various fund managers in terms of mm -hmm. the minimum, the minimum amounts to start with, but uh, then there's no maximum amount. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Joseph, for that. Uh, we are almost at the end of our, our meeting today, but we have a few more questions that we can tackle very quickly. Um, Benson, we have a question here saying, what, what role does SEG play in the upcoming agricultural schemes which have been tabbed as buy share and end profits after harvest? And then while we have that, uh, we also have a follow-up question to the question that uh, you had responded to on um, how one can, can become a fund manager. You said they firstly have to get a license. So this follow-up question is that, so can I then source funds from the public afterwards when, once I get my license, license from SEC and do all the steps correctly? Yeah, thank you. So I'll start with the, the second one. I think it's yeah. it's um, more straightforward. Yes, after you have gone through the steps, you've gotten the license, you've got your you you've had your your fund authorized by the commission. You would then be allowed to go out to the public and market your scheme. So yes, essentially, you're inviting people to invest in it, uh, and yeah, the, the, that that would be allowable um, given that you've gone through the the due process. Uh, in terms of um, the commission's position on contract, well, contract farming is, is what I, I assume is being referred to. We issued yeah. a statement uh, earlier on in the year, uh, and essentially that statement uh, puts it quite clearly in terms of the, the, the commission's um, position in relation to these um, mushrooming contract farming schemes. Uh, in, in that statement, we are essentially uh, asking the public to be cautious, uh, to ensure that they, they understand these uh, investment propositions. They are not licensed by the commission. Uh, and uh, we've, we've seen in the past that a couple of them have actually gone bust. And so the position is clear that um, these funds or these investments are risky. And we advise members of the public against investing in such schemes. So uh, if you are able to, you can go onto our website, the comprehensive statement that uh, stipulates in detail what the commission's position is in this regard is, is on the website. Uh, you, you, you'll be able to find it there. Okay. Uh, thank you, Benson. One last question. Uh, how can Zamdens invest in companies listed on other stock markets like Facebook, Apple, on the NYSE? and others that are going through the offshore unit trust fund, other than going through the offshore unit trust fund. Okay, um, thank you, um, Sitali, for that question. So again, for, for that one, we, 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 we've had one of the participants of the ended, sandbox regulatory sandbox cohort uh, kukula capital was actually a pioneering an innovation where they're allowing for that type of transactions to to happen so in essence they provide uh, a, a platform or a portal that gives you access to these global securities uh, in, in in markets like the united states some selected markets in europe and asia as well where you can have access to some of those those investments uh, it's it's not a common product uh, right now. So I know Kokula is the only entity I know of, um, that's within the sandbox that was offering that particular service, Kokula Capital. Um, however, I think there's there's still an opportunity for for other players within the market to 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 offer such services. What I've tended to see is that products like that that are available on the international market would usually not allow. Uh, members of the public who may not, for example, be domiciled in the United States and in the more developed countries to participate, or they'll have quite high minimum requirements, which then precludes a lot of people from participating. 
but um, the, the product in the sandbox, the regulatory sandbox on uh, global securities being offered by Kukula Capital uh, allows for, for, for players to be able to, to do that. So maybe that's one you could explore. Uh, but yes, I think there's an opportunity there for the market uh, to, to, to be able to offer this service. Okay. Thank you. Um, thank you so much, Benson. Thank you so much, Joseph, as well, for the responses to the questions we've had. We've come to the end of our town hall. Sorry, I just, want just to a think... quick correction, if you allow me, on, on oh, yes. my presentation. Yes. So in, in the presentation, um, I, I had made reference to the assets under management. Uh, so for the local funds, I had made reference to 1.7 trillion uh, kwacha, and I had also then made reference to 273 uh, the billion for for the foreign CISs. So I just wanted to um, mention that that was a slight error. I think I was using my mind before rebasing uh, when I was putting <laughs> those figures together. So that's actually 1.7 billion kwacha yeah. for the local funds and 273 million kwacha for the for the for the foreign funds. I just thought I make that uh, clarification. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much, Benson. I hope uh, everyone has taken note of the, the correction in the figures there. I uh, just want to thank everybody for joining us today for another interesting town hall. Thank you to our presenters, Benson and Joseph. Uh, we would ask everybody to join us again at the end of uh, October, where we have another interesting town hall. And I must mention here that uh, October is our investment month. So we have what is called the World Investment Investor Week, which we are commemorating as the Securities and Exchange Commission and the capital markets at large. So our theme for this uh, week is cultivating resilience and wise habits. A smart investor avoids fraud. So we are going to see a lot of Facebook posts, a lot of activities throughout the month of October, but the actual commemorations happen from the 2nd of October to the 8th of October. We are going to post, um, before the meeting ends, uh, Sishwane, could you just share the, the program for the events that are taking place throughout the week? And the public is free to join us. We will have webinars, we'll have school engagements, a university engagement. We're also going to have an exhibition, which will be held on Saturday and Sunday, the 7th and the 8th at um, East Park. So please feel free to join us there, come through. You will be able to meet the capital market operators, interact with them, ask as many questions as possible, and at the end of the day, be a smart investor. Thank you once again. Have a good day.